Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, today we're going to kind of finish off our discussion about analytic solutions to PDEs. Okay, so we know about the Laplace transform. We know the Laplace transforms can be super useful for solving ODEs, and we're going to find out that um, similar to, to Fourier transforms, Laplace transforms give us the ability to turn a partial differential equation into an ordinary differential equation, which is a huge simplification. Okay, so I'm going to do two examples in class today, and then on Friday, I think we're going to move towards uh, just doing some numerical solutions to PDEs, because um, I want you to know that you can solve things that aren't just simple linear wave equation or simple linear heat equation or simple linear Poisson or Laplace equation. Okay, so we might do something like nonlinear Schrodinger or complex Ginzburg Landau or something that is a little bit nastier and more nonlinear that we can do in a computer, but we can't do on the board. Okay, good. Uh, so I'm just going to do two examples for the Laplace transform uh, on a PDE because I think that's the best way to explain how this thing works is just to show you. Uh, so how, what types of partial differential equations are good for Fourier transform solutions? Start telling me things about the PDE that might make you think, aha, I should be using a Fourier transform. This is important, right, because when you uh, are in the real world, you're going to have a PDE and you're going to need to solve it and you're going to have to think to yourself, aha, I better use this method or else you're just going to have to try everything until something works. Sorry? So periodic would be good if you wanted to use a Fourier series, um, but not the Fourier transform. Uh, back, could you? Yes. Correct. Okay. So it should be somewhat continuous. It actually doesn't have to be. Yeah, it has to be continuous. It should be continuous. Good. It should be integrable, meaning it's kind of bounded as you go to infinity. And what else? It should have a domain that goes to infinity. So it's great for, for functions that are kind of defined on an infinite domain and are not necessarily periodic on a finite domain. Okay, what about boundary conditions and initial conditions? What do I need if I want to solve a system using Fourier transforms? Right, I need some initial condition at all points space, x, at time zero. And I need the kind of simple boundary condition that things get boring at infinity. Okay, so Laplace transforms is similar. They're good for PDEs, but they're good for PDEs on a semi-infinite domain. So instead of negative infinity to infinity, we're going to use Laplace transforms on half infinite domains, so semi infinite domain. And that just means that x uh, has to be greater than or equal to 0, but it can go up to positive infinity. So the first example we're going to do is the infinitely long, thin steel rod with some temperature distribution, except it's going to be half infinite. It's going to start at zero, and it's going to go to a positive infinity. Uh, OK, so the equation for a heat in a rod is what? Ut. Something like that. I hope this is the first example I'm doing. Good. OK. Uh, and let's just say that the heat constant is 1. It'll make our lives a lot easier not having alphas floating around. Okay, um, so we're going to have this on uh, x from 0 to infinity. And now, what kind of initial conditions and boundary conditions do I need? I probably still need to know what the temperature distribution is at time zero. All right, I probably still need some initial condition of what the temperature is at time zero. So I need um, u of, at all of points x at time zero. And I'm just going to use, these are values I used in the last qualifying exam that I wrote. So I'm, just sol I'm solving the quals that I wrote last quarter. Um, so I need some initial condition, and this isn't actually the sign, but it would just be some periodic sign would be the initial condition. OK, what else do I need? Uh, 
What else did I have in the Fourier transform case when this went to positive and negative infinity? It went to zero at the infinite boundary conditions. So Fourier transforms, my boundary conditions are kind of easy. It just goes to zero at infinity. So here, I also have that this is going to go to zero at infinity. But then I also have this left boundary condition. Okay, and I need to figure out what's happening at this left boundary condition. So what are the types of things I could impose at this left boundary condition? It's a real physical end of a steel rod, and I can do stuff to it. So what do I impose as a boundary condition? Could be insulating. It could be ux equals 0. I could fix a temperature u equals a. I could make a function. I could have a controller that's actively pumping in energy to keep this at a constant temperature. Okay, so my boundary condition here is going to be uh, u at the point x equals 0. So at the left point, for all times t, is going to be some function that I prescribe. I'm just going to make it easy, e to the minus t. Okay, so my boundary condition is just an exponentially decaying temperature that I'm imposing on the left boundary condition. It could be insulating, it could be a fixed temperature, it could be 0, anything's fine. Uh, so this is my boundary condition. Red is my initial condition. Okay, good. And what we're going to see is that when we Laplace transform this equation, the initial condition and the boundary condition are essentially going to play the roles of forcing in in the analog of, of ordinary differential equations. Okay, so we want to solve for u, the temperature distribution, and we're going to Laplace transform our equation. So what variable do you think we should Laplace transform in? We get to choose, right? We could Laplace transform with respect to time or space. Okay, why do you feel like space? Okay, I have two derivatives. Um, so let's say I Laplace transform with respect to space. So let's try L with respect to space. OK, so what does my right-hand term look like if I Laplace transform with respect to space? S squared u bar. And that's a function of s comma t minus s u bar first derivative in x evaluated at x equals 0 and time t, minus u bar evaluated at all times at point x equals 0. Right, this is just the analog of um, like s squared y bar minus s y dot at 0 minus y of 0, if this was an ODE, right? With two derivatives, this is what I would get. Now. You always have to ask yourself when you're doing this Laplace transform, do I actually have all of the information that I'm being asked for here? Do I have um, this term, u bar of, sorry, this is not a u bar. This is just u. Do I have u evaluated at x equals 0 at all points in time? OK, that's my boundary condition, right? So yes, I have this one. What about this term here? Do I know u sub x at my left boundary at all points in time? No, I don't have this. I don't have insulating boundary conditions. I don't, ha I don't know what this solution is at all points, um, at all points in, um, in time. Right? Like, I just don't have another. I, we need a second boundary condition to, to solve this using Laplace transform in space. Just like if you're doing an ordinary differential equation. Let's say I had x double dot plus x dot plus x equals 0, and I just tell you x of 0 equals 1. You can't solve this, because you need two boundary, you need two initial conditions. You also need to know what x dot equals, right? So you wouldn't be able to solve this equation with Laplace transforms unless you had two conditions, one on x and one on x dot. So the sim same thing applies here, because I have two derivatives in the x variable. I would need two boundary conditions, and I only have one. So I definitely cannot do Laplace transform in space. If I gave you another boundary condition, you certainly could. If I specified that u sub x at 0 and t equals 5, 
you could do this, no problem. Okay. This is also a question I always ask on the quals. Like, I give you a Laplace transform solution, and I would ask you to justify why you choose the variable you choose, and if you could do it in the other variable. So you have to really be thinking about what the boundary conditions and initial conditions are telling you. OK, good. So Laplace transform with respect to space doesn't work, so let's try with respect to time. OK, so the Laplace transform with respect to time. Now what do I get for my term on the left-hand side? S u bar. And now this is a function of x and s. So time is replaced by my Laplace variable. Minus u at x comma 0. So we're Laplace transforming with respect to time, so we care about time zero for this evaluation. And then on the right-hand side, I just have u bar sub x, x, second partial derivative of u bar with respect to x. OK, good. Now this is a simple ordinary differential equation, and we do, in fact, have this term here. And it's interesting. If I took the Laplace transform in space, then I would be using my boundary conditions. But because I'm taking the Laplace, Laplace transform in time, this is my initial condition. Kind of interesting. OK, so the initial condition is this term here in my Laplace transformed equation. Good. Now I'm going to rewrite this equation. This is just an ordinary differential equation. OK, this is an ODE uxx equals u times some constant plus some forcing term. So let's see if I can rewrite this in a nice way. uxx, u bar xx uh, plus s u bar equals u of, equals, uh, shit, minus, equals minus u of x and 0. So this is just rewriting this so it looks like an ordinary differential equation like we're used to. And this here is my forcing term. So my initial condition, this is weird, OK? This sounds like it's a little weird when I say it out loud. The initial temperature distribution is like a forcing term on this equation when I Laplace transform in time. I mean, that's exactly what it looks like. It's a forcing term. OK, um, you could, if this was a wave equation, if this was a guitar string from 0 to L, then plucking the string would be the forcing term. And it would look a lot like this. You'd give it some initial condition, like I'd bend the string and let it go, and it would look like a forcing term. OK, good. Um, if this term was 0, we could solve this ordinary differential equation, and that we, we would get the homogeneous solution. But since we have a forcing term, we have the homogeneous solution and a particular solution. And so I'm just going to write out what I think this is going to look like. So we think that um, u bar of x and s is going to equal the homogeneous solution to this. And just how would I find the homogeneous solution of this ODE if I forget forcing? I mean, this is a lot like y double dot minus lambda y equals 0. And so I would get like e to the plus and minus square root, e, e, e to the plus and minus square root of lambda, or e to the plus and minus square root of s. And you can verify that I don't get an i popping out, because if this moves over, it's actually positive. It's not negative. OK, so I have some coefficient a times e to the minus root s times x, plus another constant b times e to the plus root s times x, plus some particular solution. I'm going to call it psi, because psi sounds like particular to me. 
Okay, this is just how we solve an ODE. We write down the homogeneous solution, this part, plus the particular solution to forcing. And I am going to note that these constants are actually functions of my Laplace variable. So these are Laplace transform functions A of S and B of S. Any questions so far? <coughs> no? Okay, and then one last simplification. So I'm going to call this, I'm just going to call this the particular solution so we don't forget what it is. And I'm also going to say, because I have a boundary condition that my temperature distribution has to decay to zero at infinity, I'm just assuming infinity is really cold, or zero, um, one of these terms has to be zero. So if I plug in x equals positive infinity here, then this term gets really, really small. So that's good. But if I, turn in, if I plug in positive infinity here, this thing blows up. And so the only way to mitigate this growing term is to make b equal to zero. So b has to equal zero for infinite bc, for my infinite boundary condition. OK, good. Now, whenever I have an ordinary differential equation with forcing, usually what I do is I solve it first for the homogeneous case, and then I solve it for the particular case, and then I add them together. So that's what we're going to do here, except I'm going to solve the particular solution first because it's a little bit easier, I think. It's actually not easier, um, but I do it first in my notes. OK, so let's solve for the particular solution. OK, the particular solution is the solution due to forcing, due to these red initial conditions. And we know that my initial conditions look like a sine function. So I'm going to be taking some function, and that function, second derivative in x minus s times that function, is going to equal sine of 4x. OK, so my particular solution I'm going to guess is sines and cosines. This is what we did before when we had a particular solution that was like e to the something, we would guess it was e to the something. If it's sines and cosines, we're going to guess that it's sines and cosines. So let's say that psi of x and s equals um, some constant c times cosine of 4x plus some other constant d times sine of 4x. And our only job now is to find the constant c and d so that when I plug this into my ODE, it all balances out with the particular solution. OK, so what do I do? Yeah, so I need uxx and I need s times u or psi xx and s times psi. OK, so what is psi xx equals? Well, OK, the first derivative of cos 4x is minus 4 sine 4x. Yeah? Uh, your constants are functions of s. Will you ever make those change with respect to x, and then when you inverse the Laplace transform, a function of pi? So these really are going to be functions of s, and they are, they're not going to be constants. They're going to be functions of s. They're constant with respect to x. That's, so like you know, when you integrate something that has two variables, you get a constant of the variable you're not integrating with respect to. That's like what's happening here. These are really free constants in S. As long as they are constant with respect to X, that's fine. And you'll see that these are actually are going to be real functions. They're going to be functions of S. OK, so first derivative of this with respect to X is, remember, this thing is a constant with respect to X, so I can treat it like a constant is minus 4 sine 4x. Take another derivative, I get minus 16 cos 4x. So I have minus 16 c bar 
cos 4x. Uh, okay, I take the first derivative of this, I get 4 cos 4x. Take the second derivative, I get minus 16 sine 4x. So I get another minus 16 d of s sine 4x. Good. Uh, and I can just simplify a little bit. So this is just minus 16 times c of s uh, plus d of s sine 4x. OK, so we're just going to take these two things and plug it into that equation over there. We're going to plug it right into here. So what do we have? We have this thing. OK, minus 16 c bar of s cos 4x minus 16 d of s sine 4x minus s times psi minus s times c bar of s cosine 4x minus s times d bar of s sine 4x. And what does all of this equal? What does psi xx minus s psi equal? Sine 4x. OK, so it looks like our choice of basis functions for this particular solution was correct, because we're just getting coses and sines. That's good. Um, this should be pretty easy to figure out what these constants have to equal. I think. OK, so let's collect all of our sine terms together and collect all of our cosine terms together. So we have uh, s OK. We have c of s times s plus minus c of s times s plus 16 cosines. And then how many signs do we have? We have um, minus d of s. OK, so we have minus 16 d of s, minus s d of s, and then minus 1. Sorry, I'm doing a terrible job of explaining how I'm simplifying this. Um, should. Thank you. OK, and that's really important to get the, um, OK, negative, negative. This one should be positive. Good. OK, so let's, sorry, I'm just uh, simplifying this term. So all we're doing is we're taking all of our cosine terms and we're writing them over here. We have minus c of s times s plus 16 coses. And then we have this many sine 4x's. We have three terms that have sine 4x, and these are their coefficients. And they have to equal 0. So the only way that this can equal 0 for all x is if this constant is equal to 0, because I don't have any coses. So c bar of s has to equal 0. And here I have d bar of s. Minus becomes a plus. Oh, I had it right this time. So d bar of s has to equal um, 1 over s plus 16. And if d bar equals 1 over s plus 16, then this term equals 0. And we have this equality that we're looking for. This is just a really, sorry, I, I think 
there's a much easier way to explain this. All we're doing is we're taking our particular solution, plugging it into our equation, and finding out what C and D have to equal to make it make equality. Uh, and we find that C has to equal zero because there are no cosine terms in my forcing, and D has to equal one over 16 for everything to balance perfectly with the derivatives. Okay. So my particular solution is equal to 1 over s plus 16 sine 4x. We have a particular solution now. And it's nice. We have a function of s times a function of x. So they're kind of separated out, which I like. It's going to make our lives a little bit easier. OK, now the last thing we have to do is we have to identify what is the constant a hat in this term. We know that the b term is 0. We know what our particular solution is. So now all we have to do is solve for a bar. Um, and we can solve for a bar by just plugging in x equals 0. OK, so we look at x equals 0. So u bar of 0 comma s is equal to a bar of s times e to the 0. e to the 0 is just 1. OK, what is u bar at x equals 0 for Laplace variable s? of the boundary condition. Yeah. yeah, so I already used my initial condition. That was the forcing term that gave me the particular solution. Now, all I need to do is I take the Laplace transform of my boundary condition, and that gives me this term here that I need. OK, so a bar of s is equal to the Laplace tra transform of u of 0 t, which I have. That's my boundary condition. And the Laplace transform of that is 1 over s plus 1. So this equals 1 over s plus 1. So now I actually have everything I need. Okay, I'm going to write it all out. So I have u bar of x and s equals, um, maybe I'll even color code it. So this a bar comes completely from my boundary condition, and so does b bar. So 1 over s plus 1. e to the minus root s x plus my particular solution. And my particular solution is 1 over s plus 16 sine 4x. And in some sense, this is the solution of my partial differential equation. It's the solution in the frequency domain, so maybe it's not as useful as a time domain solution. But this is, in fact, a solution of the PDE. If you plug this in, everything balances out. This is the solution of the partial differential equation, and it satisfies my initial conditions, and it sounds my, satisfies my boundary conditions. So we have some dynamics, boundary conditions, and initial conditions, and we used all of the information we have, and this is the only solution that exactly satisfies all of that information. OK, questions before I inverse Laplace transform this? Fortunately, I have a second example, so we'll go through it again, and it'll make a little bit more sense the second time around. OK, so usually we actually care about what this function does in time, not just in s, right? I don't live in s. I don't understand s space intuitively. So I want u of x comma t. And how do I get that? I inverse Laplace transform this whole right-hand side. OK, a little bit tricky. Um, this is the product of two transfer functions. So if I want to inverse Laplace transform this, I could inverse Laplace transform this and then convolve it with the inverse Laplace transform of this. That's what I'm going to do. So that equals e to the minus t convolution with the inverse Laplace transform of this. Fortunately, I have a really big lookup table. 
and Mathematica. And so the inverse Laplace transform of this thing is kind of nasty. It is 1 over 2 times the square root of pi time cubed. Who would have known? e to the minus 1 over 4t. Someone got paid to figure this out a long time ago. OK? And I'm not actually going to expand this convolution, but you could write it as the integral from negative infinity to infinity and plug all this stuff in. And you could do this convolution if you really, really wanted to. Or you could plug it into MATLAB, Mathematica. OK, so now if I want to inverse Laplace transform this term, what do I have to do? Exactly. Sine of 4x is a constant with respect to s. So this is just a constant. It pops out of my Laplace transform. So all I do is inverse Laplace transform this. This one's way easier. OK, so the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s plus 16 is e to the minus 16t. So it's just e to the minus 16t sine 4x. Done. OK? And now we have an actual solution of our partial differential equation. If I didn't force my left-hand side at all, this term would go away. If I had zero boundary conditions, this would go away. And it would be way simpler, super duper simple. It would just diffuse. OK? So that's the flavor of how you solve a PDE with Laplace transform. So you need more information. You need boundary conditions and initial conditions. And you need enough boundary conditions or initial conditions to satisfy the the amount of derivatives that you have. OK, so now that we've gone through all of the math, I want you to think again about if it's why it's possible to solve this using Laplace in time, but not in space. OK, any questions before we go on to another example? Yeah? So the, the first term in that solution, are we multiplying those at this point, or is that still a convolution? This is a convolution. Okay. Yeah, this is the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s plus 1. This is the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus root s x. And if I wanted to, you know, I could plug this into a computer and numerically evaluate it. But this, like, I don't know how to solve the integral off the top of my head. And it would take one or two boards to do. So I'm just writing it as a convolution. If you gave this to Math Mathematica, it would know what to do, probably. And if it didn't, then, then there's nothing we can really do except solve it numerically. OK, so that was an example where I had a Laplace transform in time because I only had, because I had enough initial conditions to solve it in time, but I did not have enough boundary conditions to solve it in space. And so now we're going to look at a kind of opposite problem where we have enough to Laplace transform in time, but not in space. OK, no more questions? We have a little more time. OK, this, uh, this example is a little bit more intuitive. So here we're going to look at the wave equation, utt equals c squared uxx. And so this wave equation is essentially the equation for information traveling on a string, a taut string. So for example, if I took a guitar string and I tied it to one end of the room and I pulled it and I started whipping one end of it, I could get information to travel along this wave using this equation. Or if instead of tying it to the wall, I tied it to two pieces of the guitar itself, and I started plucking it, I could get information to travel uh, using this equation. This is the wave equation. But we're going to look at the wave equation on a semi-infinite string. Seems weird. Why would you have a semi-infinite string? <laughs> um, so let's say that I have a string that kind of goes off to infinity. Maybe you, maybe you can approximate this. Um, what would be a decent approximation of a semi-infinite taut string? I'm sure you can think of. Uh, like maybe I'm towing a cable. And it's a super long cable. And so as far as I'm concerned, this is you know hundreds of meters long. So I don't know like what's happening at the end. It's way far away from me. And since I'm pulling it and it's got drag, it's actually being held relatively taut. OK, so towing a cable, this is a decent approximation of what might happen if you're towing a cable. 
Um, you can think of other examples. Um, OK? And what we're going to do, again, I need to color code this for boundary conditions and initial conditions. So I'm going to have um, a boundary condition that I'm going to take this string and I'm going to start whipping it up and down. f of t. So I'm going to take this taut string. You can just imagine it's tied to something 10 buildings away and it's really, really tight. That's infinite. And I'm just whipping it up and down. So we've all done this when we were kids, right? You all would take like the jump rope or some telephone cable or something and you'd like whip it around on the ground and you'd watch all the cool waves traveling through it. At least I did. Um, and you know that when you whip this thing up and down, that history gets transmitted down the cable. Okay. So what we have is a boundary condition. U at x equals 0 for all time t is equal to some forcing function f that I'm prescribing. I'm f. And then I need to give this thing some initial conditions. And I'm going to choose 0 initial conditions. I'm going to say this string starts out 0 u of x at time 0 equals 0, and the derivative, u sub t at x and time 0 equals 0. So this thing is really motionless. It has no position, 0 position, and 0 motion. OK, so I have motionless initial conditions. And I have some external forcing boundary conditions. I'm forcing this thing. So what variable should we Laplace transform with respect to? OK, if I Laplace transform with respect to x, then I'm going to get s squared. Then I'll get uh, s squared u bar minus s u sub x at 0 minus u of 0. I don't have u sub x. So I have to Laplace transform this with respect to time, because that's the one that I have two initial conditions in. OK, so let's Laplace with respect to time. Is everyone OK with WRT? Great, with respect to uh, time. So we're going to Laplace transform. Did I Laplace transform with respect to time on that one too? Yep. OK, these are both with respect to time. <laughs> Good. Um, OK, so let's Laplace transform with respect to time. And we're going to get this term looks like uh, s squared u bar of x comma s. And then we're going to have minus s times u t at x 0 minus u of x 0. And that's going to equal c squared u bar x x. Now, this is the beauty of Laplace transforms. This is why we love Laplace transforms is because if you have really simple initial conditions, like motionless zero initial conditions, these terms both go away. It's beautiful. I have a much, much simpler system now. I have no external forcing. Now, again, think about the guitar string example. Let's say that I had this string pulled taut from you know, here to infinity, and I start plucking this thing. I just pull it down, and I let it go at time zero. That would be a forcing term. Or if I like pushed it up, that would also be a forcing term. So, you know, plucking the guitar string is forcing in the Laplace domain. But here I have motionless initial conditions. It has zero forcing. And so my ODE becomes much, much simpler. I just have um, u bar xx equals s squared over c squared u bar. That's a really simple ODE that we know how to solve. OK, good. So how do we solve this ODE? Yeah. 
it looks a lot like y dot dot equals lambda y, lambda squared y, right? This looks a lot like y double dot equals lambda squared y, where y equals u bar dot equals partial partial x, and lambda equals s over c. So it's just an ordinary differential equation like this. So we can solve this. We say u bar of x comma s is going to equal, now again, we have these functions of s as constants. So we have a bar of s times e to the minus lambda x plus b bar of s e to the plus lambda x. And there's no forcing, right? Our forcing is zero because our initial conditions were simple, which is great. OK, again, uh, how do we now use our boundary conditions to solve this? We had our initial conditions. Those made our, OD, our Laplace solution simple. Now how do we use our boundary conditions? Now I'm kind of implicitly assuming, because this thing is taught, that it's probably uh, zero amplitude deflections at infinity. So that means that this term has to be zero, and that means b has to be zero. So just like in the heat equation, we're going to say that b equals zero for uh, you know x going to infinity boundary condition. And so all we're left with is this term here. I mean, this is exactly like the other solution, right? We're doing a Laplace transform in time. So we, if we want to know what is A, so let's just ask ourselves what is A. Well, let's plug in x equals 0. And we get u bar at 0 comma s equals a bar of s times 1. e to the 0 is 1. And u bar of 0 comma s is just the Laplace transform of my fu forcing function. u bar at 0 s is just the Laplace transform of u of 0 t. I just Laplace transform with respect to time. And so this equals Laplace transform of f of t. Let's call this f bar of s. And we have a solution. It's actually super simple. This is way simpler than the wave equation, than the uh, heat equation. So u bar of x comma s is equal to uh, f bar of s, the Laplace transform of my initial conditions, of my forcing, my boundary conditions, times e to the minus s over c x. the solution of my wave equation, but we're in the Laplace transform domain, so it's not as useful as it might be if we inverse Laplace transformed. Okay, does anyone off the top of your head remember what the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus uh, x over c s is? No? I didn't either. Uh, it's a good one, though. So u of x comma t is going to be, um, is it okay with everyone if I inverse Laplace transform this one first and then this one? No? <laughs> okay. Um, so what we have is, <sighs> okay, I think that this would require looking this up in a table. You're going to get some inverse Laplace transform of this, and it's going to be some nasty expression. And then you're going to convolve it with the inverse Laplace transform of this, and when you convolve them, you get a simple expression. And the simple expression you get is a heavy side function of t minus x over c times my initial conditions f of um, t minus x over c. 
There's some magic between here and here. This is a table. Okay. It's not that hard. You can inverse Laplace transform this. You can convolve it with that. You'll find that this is exactly what you get. Um, do we know what the heavy side function looks like? Yeah? Okay, it's zero until it's not, and then it becomes one. So my heavy side function, h of t minus x over c, let's say I do this in time. I'm increasing from zero, you know, I'm increasing in time. Then when time passes through x over c, this thing bumps up to one. So let's use a color here. So when time goes to x over c, this thing bumps up to one. That's x over c. But this is a partial differential equation. I can also independently vary x for a fixed time. So let's say I look at this exact same heavy side function varying x. So now this is um, x over c. OK, now, now whenever x is less than ct, it's 1. And whenever x is greater than ct, it's 0. Does this kind of make sense what I'm doing? I'm taking this heavy side function, and I'm thinking, well, for a fixed point in space x, if I go through time, this is what my heavy side looks like. And for a fixed point in time, if I look over all of space, this is what my heavy side looks like. And so it turns out that we can draw something called an XT diagram. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of XT diagrams before in physics, like fluid dynamics. And what this XT diagram is going to tell us is information about where the forcing has reached in this string so far. Okay, it's going to tell me where the wave front of the information is in this string. So I take this information and I plot it in x and t. So it's an xt diagram, so x is on the bottom and then t is on the top, an xt diagram. And what we have here is essentially a line at, what is this, let's multiply by t, we get x equals ct is where this is uh, equal to zero. And so we have this line here, the x equals ct line. And this is the wave front of the information I'm putting into my string. So I have this string, it's taut, and I'm whipping it around, giving, putting information. Let's say I'm putting Morse code into this thing, so I'm trying to get some information across the string. These are the locations in space that haven't reached that information yet at a given time. And as time increases, I open up more and more of space. More and more of space is getting my signal the longer time goes. So down here is a dead region where u equals 0 here. This is my wave front. And up here, I'm actually having information propagation. So for example, let's do it in purple because that's what my forcing looks like. If I have some forcing in time, some f of t at x equals 0, then this information is going to be propagated along these characteristic lines. And I can predict exactly what u is going to be at some location x at some time t by looking backward and seeing what was, I, what was my forcing at that time. So I'm assuming that this is traveling at a wave speed c. Um, does this kind of make sense? It should make physical sense. The reason I picked this string is because you can actually picture what's happening here. You can picture the string. I can send a big pulse. And what's going to happen is that big pulse is going to travel down the, str the string at wave speed c. And that pulse will keep moving to farther and farther x's as time increases. Okay, so this is an extremely useful diagram for representing any kind of wave phenomenon. If I hit the hood of my car with a marble, the wave is going to propagate out. And I could draw a diagram like this, an XT diagram for that. Shock waves, uh, any other kind of waves. Okay, we'll talk more about this on Friday. Thanks.